Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's know if it's working. It's muted. It's, I'm muted. Muted. I have this muted. Try to unmute that. We're still muted. Should have just oh, muted us. Yeah. Yeah. Do I want to be green? Yeah. Green. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. Okay, welcome everyone to today's Beyond the Scope. Uh, for everyone in person, I just saw there's always Dunkin' Donuts, so for to coming out to see Mass for this. I saw there's also quite a few people online, so welcome to uh, today's Beyond the Scope. Here we can have a lot of people available for us. So for today's Beyond the Scope, we have um, Yoshi giving our talk. She's one of our staff members here at CMAS um, in charge of the Cryo EM team, so she's had a lot of experience building basically the cryo program here, learn a lot how to um, get a lot of that involved and also run microscopes, doing data analysis, all that. So um, third year of Anna, also have a ton of experience doing that. So she'll give us a nice introduction on how to do some of that data analysis mm -hmm. and uh, if you have questions on data analysis and cryo we have stuff, feel free to reach out to her at the end. Um, generally these are on the shorter end, so if you have questions, have lots of questions, put those in the Q and A. If you have problems um, in the chat, I'll be monitoring that to see how it's going. Okay, great, thanks, Dan. Um, right, so if there's any technical issues with the sound or anything, please um, let us know in the chat. Um, so this is going to be more of a tutorial, I would say, of CryoSpark version four, so the most recent version of CryoSpark, and I'm going to do a small um, analysis of a negative stain data set. Uh, my contact information you can see on the slide here. So as Dan mentioned, if you guys have questions afterwards, you want to reach out, um, please feel free to send me an email. This is an ongoing um, seminar series, the Beyond the Scope. You can see below our upcoming dates, um, and those are all at 11.30 a.m. on Fridays. Um, so please come join us if you're in person. As Dan said, there's donuts and coffee, um, and this will continue until the end of the semester. Can I get my slides to go? Okay, hold on. Okay, so just a brief overview of CMAS um, and the instrumentation that we have here. Um, obviously, we have a lot of high-end um, TEM systems as well as SEM and focused ion beams. Um, as they also mentioned, the CryoEM team mainly works um, with the Glacios and the Titan Cryos. Um, we also have um, sample preparation capabilities, so a Vitrobot Mark IV. Um, a manual plunger, et cetera. So I'm not gonna go too much into talking about the microscopes themselves. Um, this is gonna be more about what comes out of the microscope and how you analyze um, the data. And actually the data that uh, I'm showing here came from a Technia T12, uh, but we have um, for negative stain image analysis, um, a Technia TF20, as well as a T30. Um, so those were actually the microscopes that would be used to produce the data um, or the types of data that you'll see um, in this presentation. Okay, so just to give a little bit of background about myself, um, as a staff member here at CMAS, I actually started as an undergrad at OSU um, and I have um, my BS in chemistry. Um, I have a master's degree also in chemistry um, from Caltech where I focus more on um, nanofabrication, working with single wall carbon nanotubes. Um, and then I finished my PhD um, at Emory University in Atlanta. So there I focus more on um, fluorescence imaging, um, mechanotransduction, and uh, more cell biology. And then as I transitioned um, to my postdoc, um, I wanted to focus more on structural biology, um, particularly of um, proteins that are involved in hearing. And then um, with my structural biology background, I um, came to CMAS to help um, get the cryo-EM group off the ground. Okay, so hopefully some of you um, have um, seen my previous presentation um, about with the introduction to CryoSpark. So that was a while back, but that's also part of Beyond the Scope series. So that will actually help kind of with this as we transition to this side. But um, if you need to go back, you can, that's always available on our website. To highlight the cryo capabilities here, I'm mostly gonna be focusing on a part of the single particle analysis workflow. So that's the box in red. Um, we have other cryo capabilities here at CMAS, um, including tomography. The other two that are in dash boxes, I would say those are kind of more um, 
are in the, the method development phase. So we haven't quite ironed out those as capabilities, but something that we're working on. And if you as um, a researcher are interested in those, please reach out to us because we're always looking um, for collaboration opportunities with cryofib milling as well as micro -EV. Um, sorry, I jumped again a little bit, but the cryoEM workflow I'm referring to, this is, these are slides from my previous talk, um, but again, we are not responsible for the biochemistry side. That is something that the user is typically responsible for, um, but we do help with all these other steps here. So including the cryoEM sample prep on the Vitrobot, optimizing your samples um, by imaging in the Glacios. Um, these are kind of iterative steps. Um, once you finally get a nice sample, then you can move on to data acquisition in the Creos. Um, which again, the CryoSpark can also help at that point. Um, but actually I'm talking about this like detour that we're going up to negative stain. So um, if I highlight that box. So um, it's, negative stain has a lot of advantages in terms of um, doing some initial screening, especially if you're working with a new construct. So we highly encourage our users to do negative stain, um, especially if, like I said, they're in the beginning phases of starting to work with um, a specific macromolecular complex because that will tell you a lot of information about your sample and um, how heterogeneous it might be. Um, it also has some other advantages I'll explain um, in a couple of slides. So again, we're not gonna, I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about the cryo workflow necessarily, but the data that comes out um, from negative stain that, and these principles could potentially be applied to that bottom section as well. Okay, so the negative stain sample prep, for those of you um, that aren't familiar, um, you can kind of see the pictures here on the side, but it's um, very easy and fast to, pr to prepare negative stain samples, especially when you compare it to the cryo-EM um, preparation. So this can be done in minutes, I would say. Um, so essentially what you want to do is have a hydrophilic um, surface of essentially um, amorphous carbon. And here you can see an A and B. A just has... Um, a grid that has not been glow discharged. So you can see there's a large um, droplet there. Um, whereas in B, you have a nice hydrophilic grid. So you want a nice hydrophilic grid for your protein sample to spread on. Um, you use other droplets, small droplets of water to rinse off any excess sample. And then you would treat the sample in the final steps with um, a negative stain. And typically that would be a heavy metal stain. In most cases, they're uranium-based, so we typically use urinal acetate or urinal formate. Um, but the important thing to keep in mind is that your resolution is always going to be limited by the grain size of your stain. So, in theory, the best you could achieve for UA would be like let's say four to five angstroms. But generally, that's not that's not what you would achieve. Um, you're, we're talking like ten to twenty angstrom resolution of your model at the end. Um, but you will see nice high contrast images. So in the center section there, you see example images um, that came from the CryoM 101 website where you see um, all those little light um, particles here on the carbon. Those are all particles, right? And it's all on a dark background. So that's important to emphasize is that it's sort of inverted from what you would expect for CryoEM where you would have dark particles on a light background. And that'll become important when we talk about um, actual data processing downstream. So like I said, it's a very fast way to determine the, the quality of your sample and how heterogeneous it is. Um, another advantage that sometimes people point out is that actually you can image these using a low KV microscope, so like a T12, for example, and that's great because it's sometimes more accessible to more users versus having um, like a 300 KV um, TEM. So, um, and then in addition, it requires less computational power to actually analyze the data. So it does have some distinct advantages um, versus just traditional cryoEM, just jumping into cryoEM. Okay, so I do want to point out that I am my talk is specifically geared towards CryoSpark for soft, uh, as the software for image processing, but that's not to say that this is your only option. So there are lots of other um, open source type of um, programs that are available. Um, each person can decide, and each group usually decides for themselves what is the best option. So um, here I've just kind of listed some that are available to you, um, but I'm gonna be talking specifically about CrowdSpark. Okay, so this is, these are some of these are repeat slides from my previous talk, um, but I think they're important to kind of point out. So um, the general CryoEM workflow, 
So CryoSpark is an acronym. Um, it's for cryo-EM single particle ab initio reconstruction and classification. Um, and so this is the workflow generally that you go through um, as you set up a CryoSpark project. Um, so the first step is obviously data collection. Um, and then you kind of move downward. So you do motion correction. We do pre-processing, which would be motion correction, CTF estimation, then you curate all of your images. Then you go to particle picking, 2D classes, particle curation, and then you can build your 3D models and refine those down here, okay? So one thing to emphasize is that we're not gonna do motion correction, right? Because we don't have that for negative stain. So that's one, um, one of the main differences. Um, and this workflow will be much more simplified um, as I walk you through it. So this is something just to keep in mind. Obviously these steps are also iterative, so you can go back, um, you can make changes, come back to different steps. Um, so it's not like a single linear workflow. Okay, so as a reminder from last time, there is within CryoSpark a hierarchy or internal structure that it uses. So you have one large project and generally, I would say that project revolves around a specific type of sample or target molecule that you're looking at. Um, it could also be like a family of those um, types of proteins. So if you have different mutants or whatever, you might want to keep them all lumped together in one project. That's kind of a personal preference type of thing, how you want to organize everything. Within that project, there will be as many workspaces as you would like. Um, the workspaces are essentially containers that will hold different jobs. And jobs are, are the basic unit or the processing operation that CryoSpark is gonna carry out. Okay, so for example, one way people might structure this is, you know, let's say you have multiple days or different days of data collection and you wanna keep those separate. So you would have different workspaces for each of the different um, data collections. Um, or for example, let's say you wanna try a different particle picking strategy and you wanna keep those separate. Um, then you might wanna create two different workspaces for that. Okay, so those are just kind of ideas of how you can organize this. But again, everyone will do it slightly differently. And that's just to kind of keep in mind of the overall structure. You can share or link jobs between workspaces, but you can't do that between projects, right? So a project is like a standalone um, item and you can't pull different workspaces or jobs from other projects, okay? So that's something important to keep in mind. So I'm gonna now, switch, hopefully this will work, um, to the CryoSpark interface that we have here on our GPU system at CMAS. And yours should look similar um, if you're using the new version of CryoSpark, which is CryoSpark version four. Uh, let's see. Okay, so <clears throat> the first thing that you'll notice when you um, open up the new dashboard here is that um, they give you a lot of information about um, this is probably more informative for a Linux administrator in terms of how many jobs are being run, when they're being run. Um, there's a heat map of um, you know, the past, whatever, year or so of, of jobs. Um, it also tells you what's currently running um, and where it's being run. So again, this is probably not as informative for the individual user, um, but you can see what is um, already in the pipeline and then if your job is gonna come up and run soon. Um, but down below, actually, I think is a lot of good resources. So they have links to the tutorials. Um, they also have a link to the discussion forum where you can post questions that you might have. So things that don't get answered um, in this talk, you could always post there. Um, and then any user can come in and, and try and help you out and answer. Um, you will notice that mine says that it needs an update soon. So there is a newer version that has just come out. So I should um, update the software soon and it'll tell you what is new and available in that one. Um, so that is kind of the dashboard or this home button here um, on the left. So the navigation bar on the left are sort of quick links to get you where you need to go. If I click on this um, filing cabinet here, if I click on that, that will show me all of the projects um, and since I'm the administrator here, I'll see all of the projects that have been created by all of the users um, using this software. And so we have 73 different projects going on. Um, I'm just gonna talk about project 73 because that's the data set that I'm gonna be um, walking through with everyone. Um, but then this gives you an overview of all the projects you've created. The lightning bolt here shows us CryoSpark Live. So now CryoSpark Live is fully integrated into Sort of the regular CryoSpark, so there isn't a separate interface for that. Um, so we will do this for on-the-fly processing 
to measure the quality of data that comes out of um, the Grios or Glacios. And then there's a bunch of other buttons here I'm not going to talk about, but the main three um, that you want to see are here on the left. Um, so if you're starting out um, with wanting to begin a new project, um, obviously they make it pretty obvious to you how to, how to navigate. So um, everything will be pretty well highlighted. Now, the other thing I'm hiding here, there's a sidebar um, which will pop out and give you more options um, because the screen is, I don't want to, I don't want to be too small. I'm going to just close that. But let's just say I, you are ready to start a new project. Then you would just um, kind of begin here in the corner and you would create a title and then show it where you actually want to create the project. Um, we're not going to go through that process because I've already created the project, um, but that's how you would launch a new one. Um, so again, I think for a novice user, CryoSpark is great because um, it's very user friendly. Things seem very intuitive. So that's kind of why we have most of our users kind of start um, using, using CryoSpark. Okay, so let me go back real quick to the presentation. Okay. So pre-processing and value stain images. So this, like I mentioned, the steps are gonna be pretty similar to what you would do for negative stain or cryo-EM images. Um, and the first thing is obviously you need to get your data into, um, into CryoSpark. And so a couple of key things to keep in mind with negative stain images that we've found. Um, we're gonna run a job called import micrographs. Makes sense. Um, in general, we need, it should be an MRC format. We've run into some issues when we try to use TIFF. Um, so we recommend that it's an MRC. You do have to have information about how the data was collected. So for example, you need to know the pixel size for the camera that you were using, um, the voltage it was collected at, accelerating voltage, um, theoretical operation, and then total dose. So those are kind of the main um, inputs that you need to give CryoSpark. Um, the other key things are you need to do two things when you import. There is a toggle that we need to activate to tell it that it's using negative stain data and it's not cryo-EM data. So that's that one. And the second one is a second toggle, which says we need to output a constant CTF. Um, and I'll explain why that is in, when, we get, when I go back and show you. Um, so for example, like I said, when you saw the example of the images, um, for negative stain, we have light on dark versus dark on light. And so that's what that, for, that first toggle will do is it will indicate to CryoSpark that the, the sign for that data should be a negative one. And that actually, um, that will trigger a bunch of changes within the CryoSpark workflow. So once you click it at the beginning, it will activate that for the rest of the processing steps downstream. So you don't have to think about it anymore. Um, the second point about the constant CTF so for negative stain data in particular, you don't necessarily want it to do CTF correction because it might um, decrease the quality of your 2D classification re and reconstruction results. And that's something they just straight up tell you that CryoSpark, will, or CryoSpark tells you um, when you import the data. So those two also need to be kind of changed from the default um, settings. So let's go back real quick, just one second. And actually, before I do that, I'm going to go to the next slide because what I'm going to do is I'm going to import some tutorial data um, from Empire. So Empire is a database of cryo-EM data. And it's not just, um, I shouldn't say not just cryo-EM data, but also negative stain data. So this is where I found this particular data set. Um, if you want to go download it yourself, you can. I just took the first 100 images from this data set and downloaded it for analysis. And then all of those metrics that I said that we needed to know, I've listed here because that's what you have to input when we import. Um, those should all be provided for you um, either from whoever collected the data or you can get that from the instrument manager. If you're getting it from a database like this, it's typically provided um, in an XML file or a text file, something like that. Um, so these are the parameters we need to know. Um, the other thing I should say is that I highly encourage people that are new to data processing to take advantage of Empire because there are, there are hundreds and hundreds of data sets that you could download and practice on. So if you want to learn more about processing, you can download them. You could look at the paper, see how they did their workflow. You should be able to go through and replicate all the steps and get to the same result that they did. Um, so it's a great option to use kind of real data versus like proteasome data or like GrowEL or something that's relatively easy. It's like a real data set. 
So um, I highly recommend if you want to, to give that a try as well. Okay, so let's go back real quick to CryoSpark. Okay, so as I mentioned, I already created a project here, which has the data set. So that's Empire um, 10538. So I'm gonna open this. And I'm, this has three different workspaces within it, okay? And I've already created, um, so we're gonna mainly work in workspace two because that's kind of where I worked <laughs> things out in the logical workflow. Um, workspace one, I was just using to kind of test different things. So let's um, let's start, actually, I'm gonna, well, well, when I import the data, let's just create a new workspace. So I'm just gonna give it a new title, call it W4, and I'm gonna create it. Okay, so when I create a new workspace, it actually prompts me to do the thing I just told you, which is import the data. So we can just go ahead and do that. So I would just import micrographs and it's created this job here. And now we kind of need this side, uh, the sidebar that I minimized here to pop out. Um, and so we're now building this job, which is called import micrographs. And what it needs to know, right, is where the data is located. So I'm gonna tell it the path for the data. So when I click on the little folder here, I can tell it where to look. So I'm gonna tell it um, where the data set is located. And so this, this, this one right here. And inside are the 100 MRC files that I have. So I wanna select all of them. So I'm just gonna tell it to pick all of the MRC files that it sees in there. I'm gonna say select. Okay, so that's one piece of information that it needs. As we scroll down here, you can see the pixel size. So that was 2.4, oh, sorry, not 3.4, 2.4. Um, the accelerating voltage was 100 kV. Um, the spherical aberration for this particular microscope was two. And the exposure they didn't say, but I'm just gonna put in 100 as a, as a good estimate. Um, and then here are the two toggles that I was talking about. So you need to indicate it's negative stain data. You also need to indicate that you have, you want to output constant CTF. Okay, so those are the two. And then I'm gonna queue the job. Everything else can stay as default. So when I queue the job, it's gonna start um, running on our GPU computer, which is kind of located in the back. And if we watch the event log, um, you can watch as it's getting everything ready to go. Okay, and then as it pops up, you should see the micrographs sort of roll in. Okay, so that's, that's important. So a couple of things to highlight here that I didn't mention. So on this um, right side, the right side, the sidebar here, um, there are under the builder tab, these are all of the jobs that you could potentially run um, in CrowdSpark. So these are all the options it'll give you. The nice thing is they've kind of tagged everything now. So you'll notice all these like multicolor tags on the right. Um, so it will tell you, for example, if a job is interactive, which means that you as a user would intervene with that or um, you know, have to select something or, or do something. Um, it also tells you if the job can be GPU accelerated. So for example, if this is multi-GPU, then you can use multiple GPUs to make the job go faster. So for example, for motion correction or um, in CTF estimation, those are when you would probably wanna use multi-GPU. Um, so it gives you a lot of information about the jobs and the type of job you want to select. Now, I will say as you build the job, um, or if you have a job or a job that's already here, it'll give you details about that if you click on the details tab as well. Okay, so let's go back. So that was just importing, which is pretty straightforward. Um, but you do have to make those, um, those two toggles that I mentioned as you import your data. That's critical um, so that it recognizes that it's negative stain data. So the next step after this, which the nice thing is um, we have the builder right here. I'll just build it right here. Um, so the next step would actually be, um, and it's all in order, right? So I said, we imported the data. We're not gonna do motion correction because there's no need to do that for negative stain data. So the next step would be CTF estimation, right? So you're kind of just working down the builder list and we're gonna use the CTF um, find job here. Okay, so when I click on it, I can, it's active, I can build, the job and I can make changes on the right side here. So I will, the thing I will say about CTF, so let's just go back to the slides real quick. Um, so the next step I said is CTF estimation. So we're gonna use um, CTF find for 
um, to do that. Mainly what we're trying to do is to measure, I would say mostly this defocus is what we care about. Um, and the changes that we need to make here for negative stain processing is that we need to change the amplitude contrast. So the default value is gonna be 0 0.07. And I would say the suggested range for negative stain data is gonna be between 0 0.25 and 0 0.8. Um, somewhere in that range will be better. And the reason or how you'll know that you picked the right or a correct uh, contrast value is that you're going to check the quality of the fit after it's done. So if it looks wrong, if the tone rings don't align with the fit, then you know it's not right. So you got to do it again. Um, you can also sort of make it go a little bit faster by increasing the minimum resolution to 50 angstroms. I think the default's like 30. Um, and then you can also um, not have it do an exhaustive search, just make it have it do a fast search and that's fine. Um, especially for negative stain, that's not a problem. And then you're actually gonna go in and look at the images, right? And you're gonna see um, which ones you wanna keep and which ones you wanna toss out after that. Um, so let's go back, try to spark, so I can show you how to do that. Okay, so what did I say? So let's just say we're gonna change the amplitude contrast here to 0 0.4, right? And when I change the value, this box will change from whatever it was, I think purple to green. So it knows I've made a change. And also if you look in this job card, it'll tell you things that you've changed from default. So the default was 0 0.07 and now it's 0 0.4. Um, the minimum resolution default is 30. So then I'm changing that to 50, okay? And then the last one is this slower, more exhaustive search. I don't wanna do that. So I'm just gonna turn it off. Okay, and then you just scroll to the bottom and we're going, oh, actually I have not, the one thing I have not done. So here it tells me I haven't done all the things I need to do. The reason why is because I don't have the images in there. So it's asking me where are the images that you want to actually run this job on. And so all you need to do is click on the previous job and on the right-hand side is gonna be all the outputs from that job. So I'm just gonna drag the micrographs over. So now it knows what images I want to actually fit do the CTF estimation for. And once I've done that, now queue job has become available. So I'm gonna go ahead and queue the job. Um, I'm just gonna run it on, I'm not gonna talk about the lanes, but I just, you don't need multi-GPU for this. So I'm just gonna load it up. Okay, so it should be relatively fast um, because we told it to go fast. Um, and what we wanna see, right, is the quality of the CTF fit to the data. Okay, if you have no idea what we're talking about with the CTF fit, then we'll have to, we might have to back up further, <laughs> but um, we can talk about that later. So what you wanna see, right, like I, as I mentioned, is that the experimental data, the FFT, fits the CTF fit, which is what you wanna see. So this is good. Like you see that the fit actually fits the data. Um, I have one that's a bad example. So for example, um, job two here, right? You can see how the experimental fit is poor, or the, sorry, the fit is poor to the experimental data. Right, so that's an example where you need to go back, probably change the amplitude contrast, come back and see if it matches well. Um, this is job five here is another example, which is poor. So this, this first one does not match well, okay? So that should be relatively quick. And here at the bottom, you can see how long the job is taking, um, what resources it's taking up and um, just other metrics down here at the bottom, okay? So once you've done that with all 100 images, so the job's already complete. It only took one minute to do that. Um, the next step you would want to do, right, is you want to curate the exposures. So you want to look at the data and see which ones do I actually want to work with and which ones, you know, are we, we toss. And so the easiest way to do this um, is now in CrowdSpark 4, they have these, um, if you click on this dot, dot, dot region, um, it, Actually, this one won't give it to me, but there, it will give you options typically of the jobs that you can run after you run this job. Um, so this is not, um, curation is not an option here. So I just need to go back to the builder and click on manually curate. Okay, so the one thing it's gonna ask me for is obviously where are the images, right? So I'm gonna click on the previous job again, and I'm just gonna drag the images from the right side that I wanna curate and I'm gonna queue it. Okay, so um, curating exposures is an interactive job, which means that I'm gonna to have to tell it um, which, which ones to keep and which ones to toss. 
And so when this box turns pink, it's waiting for me to do something. So when I click on the card, an interface should open and I'm gonna just minimize this. Okay, so <clears throat> there's a lot of metrics to look at. Um, so what I'm gonna say, there's hundred images here, right? You can see zero to 100. I can select whatever metric I wanna look at. If I wanna look at defocus, if I wanna look at how stigmatic the images are, um, any of these things in the list I can plot it against, okay? Um, if I wanna look at individual images, I can just click on any of these micrographs here at the bottom. Hopefully you have a bigger monitor so you can see things. But let's say I wanna look at image number five. So image number five is loading. What you'll see is a picture is the micrograph itself. You'll see the CTF fit, and then you'll see the 1D CTF plot, okay? So again, we're just checking to make sure that this fit is good. And generally I check a few just to make sure that that's the case and it is. Okay. Now the other option it gives you is to threshold. So let's say I don't want to see, or I don't want to include any images that have um, very high astigmatism, right? Like, let's just say I don't want that. Um, so what you can do is you can set a threshold. So I can say, let's say I don't want anything that has, um, that's like below 350. Okay. So I can say I'll set a threshold and then it will only accept the images that have the astigmatism below 350, right? So it rejected, and up here it kind of gives you a summary, it rejected six of the images. And so let's say, okay, that's what I wanna use as my metric and I'm done. So now what it has done is it's gonna create these different um, groups of exposures. So ones that I have deemed acceptable, the ones I've rejected, and then anything else is left over. Okay, so that's just how you, how do you want to filter out your images, right? So like, how do you decide which ones need to go and which ones can stay? Um, if you want to, some people will go in one by one, look at each image. If they like the quality of the image, keep it, otherwise reject. Okay, so you can do it manually or you can set thresholds, however you want to do it. Um, generally speaking for this data set, I found that the quality is pretty high across all of them. So I think what I did, so let's say go back here um, and I look at this, I kept, um, I think roughly 95, I want to say, of the images. And then I rejected, um, so if I look at the outputs from here, um, I have kept 95 and rejected six. So the, the, the quality of the data was good. Okay, so that's all the pre-processing. So that's where the bulk of the changes are going to be from how you would do a cryo-EM data processing. So the, those toggles that I was talking about um, changing the amplitude contrast, those are the keys to really doing negative process, stain processing well, in my opinion. The rest of it is going to be very similar to how you would do um, a cryo-EM work set or um, data set. So this isn't going to be too different from the previous, um, the previous talk that I gave, but um, let's go back real quick to the presentation. So, um, so we've curated, we've done all this pre-processing which is great. So now we have, you know, our set of micrographs that we want to work with. Okay, so this is where it gets a little bit, I would say more of a personal preference, how you wanna approach um, particle picking and 2D classification. So I'm outlining the different strategies for you and then I'm gonna show you the results of those strategies on this particular data set. Um, and then you can, you can decide how to go from there. So. These are kind of like, I would say, sort of more standard options. And then obviously you're gonna decide what to do once you actually see what the outputs of these are. So <clears throat> I would generally start using a manual picker and I would pick a small number of particles from each, from not all of them, so like a subset of those micrographs. Let's say I'm gonna pick 500 particles um, like on 10 different images and I'm gonna use that to generate a template. And that template I can then use to actually look at the rest of the hundred micrographs, okay, and have have um, have CryoSpark pick those out, okay, because you don't want to go through and manually pick on all of your images. Um, so then, once you do the template picker, you'll have a pool of particles, and then those particles you would do 2D classification. So that's one option, which is pretty common. The second option is you let CryoSpark do all the work. So you tell it, I my particle is a blob. Let's say it's circular. It's going to have a diameter of 200 angstroms, 200 to 400 angstroms. Um, 
you go to the images and you find those blobs. Um, and so it's very un unbiased in the sense that CryoSpark is doing all the picking. You're not doing any manual picking. Um, then you will extract all of those from the 100 micrographs and then do the classification. The third option is, let's say you have a really difficult particle to pick, then this might, option might be the best for you where you're actually using um, sort of the deep learning algorithms to, to pick what you need. And you do have to train those. So it's not just, you know, you don't just let it go. You have to kind of give it um, some information to start with, and then it will go through. And this is, for example, warp or Cryolo. Um, and Topaz is integrated in CryoSpark, but I don't think the other two are. So those are kind of like the three, I would say, strategies, most popular strategies that people use. Um, I'll show you the results from one and two. Um, I didn't do it for three, but I can show you how one and two work up. And then again, the idea is there from those particles, you would classify them into different groups. Um, okay, so let's go back to CryoSpark. Okay, so I am going to, I created some tags to show you kind of the strategy um, and the results from that strategy first. Okay, so first steps we already did, right? We imported everything. We did the CTF estimation, we curated them. And then what I did is I picked 587 particles manually. Um, this is job 27 here. Let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Okay, so job 27 here. I went in and I picked 587 particles by hand on 10 different micrographs and um, had it do a 2D classification. Okay, so for the, this is the result of that 2D classification here. So if I open this job, I think I can show you the log. Okay, so here you can see the 2D classes. They're really fuzzy because there's only 500 some particles, right? But you can clearly see which ones are particles and which ones are just garbage, right? So mainly the top row is what I would select as my templates. Um, and then uh, everything else I would just discard, okay? And so that's what I did. In the next job over, I just selected what I thought were the best 2D classes. And that's what I decided my template was gonna be. So now what it's gonna do is gonna go back to all 100 images with the template picker. Oops, sorry, I did not mean to click on that. Um, so in job 30, I ran a template picker job and these are all with default parameters. I didn't do anything. I didn't change anything in the job builder. Um, and I went through, and it went through all 100 micro or 95 micrographs because I curated out some of them. And it picked roughly 60,000 particles from those. Um, and so then if you click on this job, you can actually see, I think the first 10 or so um, results from that, I wanna say. So these are the templates. There's just masks of what it's looking for based upon the 2D classes I selected. And then if you look at the actual images here, you'll see each of those little pink dots re represents what it thinks is a particle. Clearly some of those are wrong, right? So some of them aren't even on particles. Um, but with, that's what we'll do in the next step is tell it, okay, these are actually real particles and that other stuff is not correct, okay? So all 60,000 of those are not particles. You can clearly see, right? But you wanna just make sure that the majority that are particles do have a pink dot on it. Does that make sense? So it actually did select the particles, there's just other stuff in the way, okay? So we just have to tell it what is real and what's not, okay? So it did think there were 60,000, but that's not true. So then the next step, which is also just a default job is to inspect them. And then what you do is you empirically go through and you tell it, this is a real particle versus that's not a real particle. So there's different, um, two different metrics you can set. So the NCC score and the local power, which I'm not gonna, um, um, talk about too much, but basically it's gonna, and it is over selecting and that's actually probably okay versus under selecting because then we can sort of further get rid of the bad stuff when we do a 2D classification. But each of those circles represents what it thinks a particle is. Okay. So there's actually only roughly 10,000. So from that 60,000, when I inspected it, I decided only 10,000 of those were good. Okay. And then I essentially extracted all of those particles out of the images. So that's the last step here in the pre-processing. So this is again, a default. Um, we do have to tell it what size box. So this is roughly 320 pixels. So you wanna make sure that the full particle is within um, that box. And I'll go, um, I'm not sure, I'm kind of running out of time, but we'll, we'll just talk about, I'll move on with this and then you can see the results. So um, the second, so with the most, so what I call processing 
workflow number one, let's say, which was the manual picking and then the template picker. Um, so now I have, um, I inspected the picks, I extracted them. When I extracted them, I actually only ended up with 7,800 particles. The reason why is probably some of them were the same particle that were selected um, and they're duplicates. So it got rid of the duplicates. Um, and then now we're down to 7,800. And when I do the 2D classification here, what you'll notice is that it's gonna look um, a lot cleaner, right? So there's, it's not a huge difference, but it's definitely not as noisy as when you saw um, when I made the template, right? Okay, so we have to pause here because sometimes this is enough information for people to be done with negative stain. <laughs> so let's say you're just asking yourself, is my particle a monomer or dimer? Or does it have this shape? Um, this would be enough information. You could look at the envelope. You could see, you know, clearly if there's like two parts or one part or whatever it is your question is, maybe that's enough, right? So maybe you don't have to go any further than this, right? You want to just see the, the two glasses. Um, that's totally fine. Um, I would, so from those, right, I would probably only select these nine classes as what I would call valid classes. The rest are just garbage or um, not clean. So I would sort of filter those down um, into these final nine, okay? Which leaves us with roughly 5,000 particles in the end, okay? Um, so let me just real quick go back here um, to the slides. Um, so as I, I didn't mention this, but roughly the box size should be double the diameter of your particle, roughly. For negative stain, it's not a huge deal, um, but if you know roughly what the size of the particle is, um, then I would just go double that. Um, Obviously the larger, the better, but then that costs you more computationally to do the analysis. But for negative stain, it's not a big deal. You can just go bigger. That's not, that's not a problem. Um, so these are the results that I just showed you in CryoSpark, but a little bit cleaner. So I had 20 classes total. I told it to make 20 classes. You could pick more if you want to. Um, and then those were filtered down into these nine classes that I would have picked in 5,000 total. Okay, so the next step would be 3D reconstruction, right? So let's say you want to make a build a 3D model. Um, this is where it starts to be a little bit of what um, kind of like a personal preference, how you want to process data. Okay, so I'm going to give you option one. So option one, I'm sorry, not that one. Okay, option one here would be to take all those nice clean 2D classes, all the particles that were in those nice clean 2D classes, all 5,136 of them, and use that to build the ab initio model. So that's what this is. It doesn't look like much, I know, but, um, and then you would refine that model as a single model. So you say, I only have one confirmation. This is the confirmation, refine that model, okay? And if you look here, the resolution is not great. It's like 17. So it's not like amazing, but that's normal for, for negative stain. Um, so that is one, one option, but let's say it's not, um, so hold on, let's, and I'll show you what the model looks like. Okay, so once you get the model, what does it look like, right? Or what do you see? So when you open the, when you open the map, this is what you're gonna see. Um, the first thing you wanna do, this is in Chimera. Um, I'm just gonna change the step value here and then I'm gonna adjust it. So we wanna basically get rid of that background um, noise, but this is the, let me zoom in. Okay, so this is that 17 angstrom 3D model that it built. Okay, which is actually very consistent with what was um, deposited into um, Empire. Um, so this is what it built from those 2D classes and made a 3D model, and this is what it is. And it actually makes sense because it's like a bot, it's like a lobe that has two arms. Um, so this, and you could dock a real like crystal structure in there if you had it, let's say. Okay, so this is the results, the final results that you would, that CryoSpark would spit, would spit out. Um, so let's say you don't want to try, the other option you can do, which um, I tried because I was curious if it would work. Um, so in this second option, let's say I don't want to, I just want to take all of the particles. I don't care if it's like a clean 2D class or not. I'm going to take all 7,000 particles and I'm going to build a model from that. So that's the other thing you don't necessarily, you can, you could skip over 2D classification and just build a model right away, which um, is a strategy that people have, have used. So 
Um, this final part step here where you extracted the 7,800 particles, I built a model from that. Um, and it actually ends up being pretty similar, but that's not too surprising because it's negative stain data. But for real cryo EM data, that is another valid strategy, right? So you don't have to do 2D classification, um, but you could just jump straight to the 3D model. Okay, so the blob picker, what I will say about the blob picker is that for this particular um, data set, it did not work well. I don't know what happened to my jobs, but um, I could not, so all those little pink dots, right, where it tried to find the particles, it could not actually accurately find them at all. So um, I would not have recommended blob picker for this, um, for this data set, okay? Um, let me just go back, okay. So that's what I just mentioned. Um, so if we go back a couple, right. So I just showed you the results of one, right? And then um, for two, it did not work for this particular case. So I could not accurately um, pick the particles um, from the micrographs. Okay. And so then when you do refinement, everything, like I said, was mostly done with default settings with the reconstructions. I assumed that there was only one solution, um, which is true if you have a homogeneous sample. Um, but, and then the default symmetry is there's no symmetry, it's just C1. Um, and then I just showed you in Chimera how you import your map and you can just take a look at it and see what it looks like. Um, so again, this is the final map. This is what it looked like in the actual Empire entry, which looks pretty close. Um, and this is the type of result that you would expect from processing negative stain data. So it's not overly impressive in terms of seeing secondary structure or anything like that, but it does give you a nice envelope to look at. Okay, actually, before I wrap up, I just wanted to mention one other thing. Um, if I go back to um, CryoSpark. So they did um, make some nice changes, I thought to, oh, actually, here's the blog, blog picker. I don't know why it's not showing me the correct thing. That's a bug, okay. So I did try a bunch of different blob picker jobs. None of those was working well. It just was not um, picking the correct particles. Um, so I'll skip over that. Um, I did want to say one more thing about um, the, um, the manual picker. So if I just clone this job real quick. So I'm just going to tell it to make an identical version of that job. And let's swap the filters. Okay, so, so one of the nice things they did do, um, I'm gonna just start it. So this is an interactive job because obviously I have to go in and tell it where, um, where there are particles. One of the nice things that is, um, has been changed from CryoSpark three to four is that, Now it's gonna be slow. Okay. Um, so then one of the nice things that they did is they kind of gave you these metrics at the top. So it tells you how many images, um, it doesn't give you the total number of picks, but I think that's actually one of the upgrades in the new version. Um, but it does tell you how many, how many of the micrographs you picked particles from. Um, so what you would do, right, is you would go in and you would just select each of these. So you'll see that there is a um, purple box and then the green circle. So the green circle reflects the particle diameter, which obviously is too small. So I think I said a particle diameter of like 400, around 400. And then I would want the box size to be roughly double that, right? But this is in pixels, so it's a little bit confusing. So, um, so 320. So you want the box, right? Like I said, to be double the size of the diameter um, and you want that diameter to really go um, include the whole particle. So this is kind of a nice thing that they added. Um, and then you, once you're done, you just hit done and extract particles. So that's, I did want to point that out. It also tells you the box size ratio. So like I was saying, to get the double the size, you can do that on the fly. So I appreciated that. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the workflow that you would do with any um, negative stain data. And if you guys have questions um, about that, we can talk about it in the, at, the, at the end of this talk. So I'll still be here. Um, I did, like I said, want to highlight the upcoming events that we have going on the next two talks for February and March. 
Um, but hopefully this gives you some tips to get started. Sorry, Siri. Um, so hopefully that gives you some tips to get started. If you have questions, let me know. Um, and then there's always ways to connect with CMAS. Um, we have the Beyond the Scope series as well as a bunch of different events. So that's all I've got. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Trish. Yeah. So yeah, we have time for um, questions. If there's questions from the audience here at CMAS, um, or if there's any questions online, feel free to just you type those um, in online. Um, if you want to chat with Yoshi as well, um, and it's not going to type out too well, just raise your hand and I can go ahead and unmute you as well. I can't see the chat. Well, I could try, but yes. I have it up, but go ahead. <laughs> um, so I'm very new to electron microscopy. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> um, the, is it CFT? The CTF, yes, CTF. contrast um, transformation. When you look at that fit, so I know you like pulled up examples of them, like how do you know that fit, I guess? Like, or like, what do you look like? Yeah. Like doing it and understanding what that actually is. So this is just, right, that's a good question. So um, if you're actually collecting, it like makes a little more sense, I think, if you've gone, like if you're sitting at the microscope and collecting data, but typically what you would do when you capture an image, right, is, so you would get the images that look like this box here, right? Um, and then there's another window that typically we would have open that shows the Fourier transform of the image. So that's essentially what the CTF is, right? So whatever your image is, um, you have that CTF. And you want to just make sure that you don't see, and you can fit that function to, actually, hold on, let me, I have a slide. <laughs> it has a lot of equations on it, though, some of those people. Um, hold on, let me end the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, let me pop, pop, pop it up. Okay, so the contrast transfer function, right? So <clears throat> in normal cryo EM, you do not get a lot of, of contrast in your images, right? Because it's all phase contrast. There's no amplitude contrast. Whereas in negative stain, right, you have heavy metals. Um, so you do get a very high contrast. But in cryo EM, um, what, you would, what you're mainly doing is applying a defocus to essentially generate contrast. And so that's what this is supposed to show you is that at different defocus values, you can see how the tone rings are, are changing, right? And then you see also that function that's being plotted, that's plotting that. And that is actually <laughs> all included in this equation, um, which isn't like, don't freak out about it. But um, so a lot of this information we inputted into CryoSpark, right? We pulled it spherical aberration, um, you know, what the KV of the microscope was, and then it really depends on, um, so the defocus is key, I think. So really when we're fitting that CTF, we wanna know the defocus, and then we wanna see that those, that that function fits the experimental data like that. So when you saw that oscillating 1D CTF, you wanna make sure that matches the experimental data. So there is a lot of math behind it, but I didn't wanna go like that far into it, but it is important, it's very important to understand um, how the data is manipulated. And so again, it's, I don't want people to get too hung up on it, but really like the qual, I mean, you can just tell honestly by looking at this, that this, that's fine. Like the fit is, is good. Um, whereas in the examples where it's very poor, um, it becomes very clear, like, okay, these, there's no ring here in the center, right? So that's a red flag that that's an incorrect fit, right? Okay. Is there anything in the chat? I'm no? just in chat, yeah, but while we're waiting for any other <laughs> I, questions. I one. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just a practical question. So yeah. after you generate, after the software selects the particle, yes. when we were seeing that you had a lot of selections that they were not right, yes. and then you see that you filter is not the word, but that you filter that, how, how do you, how do, I didn't understand. Yes. Okay. Like, so yeah, let's do that. So, okay. The nice thing about the new CrowdSpark Live, like I said, um, when you click on this dot, 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 it actually tells you what you should logically do after this job, which is nice because it directs you in the right way. So I said, okay, I've, I've done the template picker. This is where I think all the particles are, right? So, okay, I'm going to go in and check. Like, I want to check to see if that's true. So I click on that. Um, it's starting the job. And this is an interactive job as well. Um, so once this says waiting, we'll, we'll open it. Okay. So I'm clicking on it and it should open. Okay, so if I look over here on the right, let's just give it a second to load. Okay, so 
So everywhere there's a green dot, it thinks there's a particle. Mm -hmm. Clearly that's not right. Okay, so what we have here is a heat map that shows you all the particles. So they're mainly clustered in that bright yellow region, right? But we have these two different values, which I have to, I would have to review exactly what they do. But basically, there are two bars that we can essentially toggle. So you can see how it's unselecting and selecting particles. So that's why I almost feel like overselecting is okay because we can tell inspect here and tell it, okay, well, that's not quite right. So you can kind of go in, but you don't want to like start you know, leaving out some good particles. So I would over select a little bit even here. Um, the power square, I would say doesn't really, in this case, doesn't really do too much, um, but you will see that as you kind of lower it, things will start to disappear. Um, I think mostly I just bring it up a little bit. So you wanna just go, and then you also wanna check not just for one image. So if you go to the, a different image, um, is it still doing a good job selecting them, right? So you can tell it clearly over selected, um, in the template picker, but now is when I can go in and tell it, okay, these are actually real. So like a human being still has to go in and tell it and say, this one's not great and it's missed some, but if I try it globally, you wanna make sure it's doing a good job picking things. And when I'm done, I say done. Um, and then here you can see the actual image of like, these are the particles, these are real. Okay, and then I think, so of those, whatever, 50,000, it's gonna, filter down to like 3,000 or 5,000, something like that. So yeah, there are still a lot of steps where, you know, you have to go in and say, this is a real thing um, or not. And the other thing I will say is that this sample is actually not homogeneous, it's heterogeneous, um, which means that you can actually build two separate models at the same time. So there is, let's say where there's like an open and closed state, right? So it can take all the particles that you give it, like all 5,000 particles that you deemed were good particles. And then it's gonna try and build two separate models and refine both of those independently. Yeah. With that, <laughs> yeah. if you were specifically looking for heterogeneity, mm -hmm. um, would you, is there any, would you just tell it to build two models after your 2D classification or you do something in the 2D classification with the classes you're putting into each model or is it just like- Yeah, so you have, a, two right, you have a couple options. Let's look at the builder. Um, so, right, you could try, so you can try homogeneous refinement and you say, okay, I think I have two classes. That's one option. There's also these other options like heterogeneous refinement. Let's say you don't know how many confirmations, then you, it tries to figure it out on its own, right? Or let's say something is very flexible. And so it, it that, in that case, you might want to do the non-uniform refinement where it's, it starts to get more complicated. I would say start with the simplest first, right? And then try and figure out how many distinct classes you actually have and then keep refining from there. Because as you think about it, like your pool of particles is getting smaller and smaller as you go down. Um, and so you may not have enough information to actually be able to build a nice model once you get to that point. Um, and it, with negative stain, like I said, you're not going to know because it's like, 17 angstrom resolution. So it's not great, but it's maybe enough information for you. So, um, but those, so there are a couple options there of how you can actually treat it. And so from what I understand, this version of CryoSpark is much better with heterogeneous refinement. I haven't tried it myself that much, and this is not a good case to test them out, but um, I think those, that's really interesting to, from a biological perspective, because most things are not rigid. Like most things are very floppy or have a lot of movement and conformational change. So um, I think they have done a lot of work on this version of CryoSpark to try and um, improve those algorithms. So that's that's all I know about it, but I can't say, I haven't explored it that much, so. Anything else? Nothing in the chat? Online's been pretty quiet. Okay. <laughs> I was, I was wondering, so yes. for this talk, I guess your last talk, you used CryoSpark for everything. Yeah. So you mentioned like four or five other yeah. software, right? So <laughs> I was kind of wondering like, why you, do you primarily use CryoSpark? Do you use the other ones for other things or what do you like for CryoSpark? Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so I will say the main difference between RelyOn and CryoSpark is the code. So RelyOn has open source code, which means that if you want to, manipulate it or change it in any way you could so if you're if you have if you're someone who has like a strong like computer science background and you want to integrate let's say different um like python scripts or make changes to the source code you could 
Um, and it's also freely available to anybody, anybody. So like academic industry, doesn't matter. Um, CryoSpark is not that way. So it's closed. You can't see, you can't see the code that's running the program um, and make changes to it. Um, also, it's not free for industrial use, but it is free for academic use. So there are certain things that people prefer about one versus the other. For me, since I work with a lot of newer users, um, I will say that the interface of CryoSpark is much more user-friendly for a beginner than Reliant. So Reliant is super powerful, um, but you have to, I mean, you could also run it from the command line <laughs> if you wanted to, but um, it's not something I would say that it's like the, the um, learning curve on that is going to be much steeper than it is for CryoSpark. So, and then the other ones, again, some of them are more applicable so far, like iMod, for example, it may have actually been intended more for tomography data processing versus single particle analysis, right? So some of them will do a lot of the same pre-processing steps and can do the others, but they weren't necessarily designed for that type of data, right? Like looking for particles or refining 3D models and things like that. So, um, so it kind of depends on like the intention in which the program was also made, if that makes sense. Um, but right now I would say the vast majority of people use use Reliant and CryoSpark and they use them interchangeably. So you can take the output from CryoSpark, put it into Reliant, vice versa. So, because some of the tools are better, I would say in Reliant versus CryoSpark, especially when it gets to 3D, 3D refinement, um, but there are ways to just convert it back and forth. I have a question from online. Oh, okay. Um, asking how much do you typically try to optimize answer to contrast and how critical is that? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think I ran into that problem. <laughs> um, let's just say I, you'll know when it's wrong. So that's when, um, that's the main thing I was changing to get. Um, so let's say, let's say, okay, so job two here, right? The CTF is or let's take a look at um, the parameters that I used. Okay. So if you go into any of the jobs, you can kind of scroll down and see what you input to get that job started. So remember the default is 0 0.07. So this one is a poor fit, right? You can see on the right exposure. Um, and I used an amplitude contrast of 0.8. So I was at the high end and it didn't work well. So it's kind of empirical in the sense that you just try it, run the job, see if it's doing well. If it's not, you just like kill it and try something else. So I think, um, for example, this one is also not great, but I think I changed it to something. Oh, this one's still 0.8, but the one that was good, I think was 0.4. So this one, job four looks better. Um, the fit is, looks correct. Um, and here I had used 0.4, right? So that's kind of how, that's the, that's how you're going to tune the quality of the CTF fit, right? Is the amplitude contrast, if that's off a little bit. And sometimes I've done like 0.2 and it's been fine. So um, I don't spend too much time, but again, if it's clearly wrong, I think, you know, so. Um, that's, I would say it took me about like four jobs to figure that out. <laughs> so uh, it did take a couple of tries. Can you just iterate, or is there like a tool to iterate that? And I, just, I don't like, know. So there's this other, yeah, I know. There's this other thing called cart. And I haven't quite figured this out yet. Um, I think you may be able to do that. You can also stack jobs, right? So if you know the order your jobs are going in, you can just, stack the outputs of each one. So when it becomes available, it jumps to the next job. and the So you don't have to like babysit it. You just let it go. And it just like, once it's done, it goes to the next job, starts that one, starts the next one. Um, but for this case, I think you need to see the output, right? You need to see the final result before you can start a new one and to change anything, if that makes sense. Um, I think you'd be able to just say, hey, <laughs> That's well, what I would do is start four jobs, right? Start one with amplitude of 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.8, you know, one, something like that. Yeah. And then I would just run them all simultaneously at the same time. So yeah, you get like efficient. There are ways there. I think there's lots of ways also to not just stack jobs, but there's other tricks you can do with CrossBark that are more advanced. I haven't talked about, but um, yeah, that's an option. They were asking, or another person's asking about converting to, to MRC. Is that oh. MRC work? 
best way to like convert it or scan it? So the way I we batch convert, there's two options. Well, there's actually there's many options. There are scripts. There's like TIFF to MRC. Uh, like TIFF2, like the number two, um, MRC, which I think is just a Python script that will convert um, directly. I think I use just digital micrograph and batch convert it that way. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Also, I'm pretty sure your wherever you collected the data, the camera that was used to collect the data, you can also batch convert. If it's like TIA or whatever, you can batch convert that way as well. Um, I, for some reason, we just had problems with TIFF. We can never get it to to work um, with the negative stain images. And that might just be something that's facility specific. Um, but yeah, that I would recommend. I don't know if something like image J would also have a batch converter for that. Um, I have not tried that, but that's, I use digital micrograph to do that, but you should be able to do it with whatever um, image collection software or image analysis, analysis software you have access to. Last call. Okay. Thanks, Josie, for the talk. Thank you. <laughs> more donuts, more donuts yeah. if you're in the building. Thank you, everyone.